Okay, so let's get started. So hello, my name is uh, Rami. I'm uh, one of the TAs for, uh, for this course. Uh, you guys won't see me this half of the semester, but I'll be TAing the lab section for uh, next, after the reading week. Uh, Professor Ismailov, who's uh, my supervisor, uh, wasn't able to make it today, so he asked me to, to fill in. So, um, I don't know, he did not tell me. So, I don't know. Um, hopefully everything's okay. Um, right, so every, anything that I teach today, uh, it's not like today's not a free class, like you have to learn what I, what I teach today. Just assume that I'm him. Um, and what I teach should be somewhere in one of the assignments, so just, just to put that out there. Okay, so uh, from my understanding, from viewing a little bit of the lectures online, uh, it seems like you guys are just starting to do the uh, sort of the mathematical foundations behind uh, quantum chemistry, quantum mechanics, and uh, so we're still going to be doing that uh, today and I think uh, Wednesday as well. So, uh, so yeah, so let's, let's try to do some stuff. Okay, so uh, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are very different, are very different but very similar in many different respects. But uh, they both involve the same thing. The idea is that you have a system and you're trying to determine the properties of the system. So in uh, classical mechanics, the procedure is rather simple. So you have a, a few observables, like uh, position, which in 1D is x. You have another... Uh, observable, which is momentum, which is also, uh, you label it as x, p, px, okay? This usually we can uh, write it as mass times dx over dt. Now the position in classical mechanics is some function which is dependent on time. And if you want to find the momentum based on the uh, trajectory that has been given to you, well, the only thing you really need to do is just do a derivative of this function with respect to time with respect to time. Uh, another observable that you may be interested in is the kinetic energy. All right. And this one is uh, simply the momentum squared divided by 2 times mass. Right, so you would uh, take the mass squared d of x t okay, you can further simplify it by by doing this right and so if you define this as being the velocity squared, this would just be the mass uh, times the velocity squared divided by two. Uh, another thing that you may be potentially interested in is the potential energy, right? And this usually depends upon the system you're dealing with. So the potential energy of a particle in a spring will be given by uh, half of k times x squared, right? This is uh, the potential energy of a spring. Now, if you're dealing with the potential energy of a particle, charged particle in an electric field, there's another different uh, potential energy expression for this. If it's, you know, this chalk in air and you're calculating the potential energy because of gravity, there's going to be a different uh, expression for the potential energy. So the potential energy is um, system dependent, but usually it's going to be given as a function of the trajectory of the system that you're dealing with. And then... Uh, Another property that we're very much interested in as well is going to be the total energy. And that one is given by the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential, uh, potential energy. Okay, so this is very standard stuff. You guys know this. You guys have probably did this a few times in 
previous classes. So this is the classical mechanics case. In quantum mechanics, uh, right, before I go to the quantum mechanics, in classical mechanics, if I give you a trajectory, if I give you a function with respect to t, you should be able to give me at any specific time what the kinetic energy is, what the momentum is, what the potential is, what the total energy is. You just derive, usually you just derive the, uh, the trajectory with respect to time in order to get some velocity, you plug it into this equation, and that's it. Quantum mechanics is a little uh, more complicated in the sense that uh, you will not be using the trajectory. What you will be using in quantum mechanics is the uh, wave function. So in classical mechanics, you're given x, and there's going to be a rule that gives you the observable. All right, so this is uh, classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics, what you will be given, usually, is the wave function, and you will be given, and you will, uh, will, this class will show you how from the wave function you can calculate an observable. All right, and so uh, I'll just move over here. And so the observable in quantum mechanics are roughly the same as the ones in classical mechanics. So again, you're going to have a uh, position. Uh, uh, you're going to have a position. You're going to have uh, uh, total energy, a position, a kinetic energy. However, now instead of just deriving the 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 the, um, the wave function with respect to time or anything, you're going to construct our so-called operators. So in uh, quantum mechanics, the rule which allows you to go from a wave function to an observable is called an operator. And in quantum mechanics, every single observable has a corresponding operator related to it. And the way that we uh, denote that we're dealing in the quantum mechanical uh, framework is to use the same, almost the same symbols as in classical mechanics, at this time we're going to put a bunch of hats on top of them. So if you're going to talk about the momentum, momentum is the p hat. If you're talking about the kinetic energy, it's uh, t hat. Potential energy and total energy is, uh, you can write it as, uh, sorry, it's usually denoted as h with a hat. Can everybody see? Maybe this thing's blocking it, but uh, okay. Uh, now these operators, they have uh, some mathematical form. So uh, the form of the x operator is rather simple. It's just x, and I'll show. I'll, I'll explain later on what do I mean when I when I say all of the things I'm saying now. Uh, the momentum is given by this form, right? So in a classical mechanics, here we're, we 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 derived. The we differentiated the trajectory with respect to t, but here what we're going to do is we're going to operate, we're going to differentiate the wave function with respect to x times this imaginary component here. And so this is the form of our momentum in uh, quantum mechanics. The uh, kinetic energy uh, can be given as uh, following, so it's going to be the momentum squared divided by 2 times mass, very similarly to the kinetic energy in classical mechanics. However, because p in quantum mechanics is different from the momentum uh, in uh, classical mechanics, uh, this will be a little different. It'll be there'll be a second derivative with respect to position and uh, ti uh, times this uh, component here with times constant and uh, the mass here. Very similarly, the potential energy in, class, in quantum mechanics is, uh, is uh, system dependent. So the potential energy in a hydrogen atom is very different from the potential energy in a helium atom, very different from the potential energy in a any water, for example, or benzene. Uh, so this is system dependent. So, but again, usually uh, it's the, 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 the potential energy is going to be a f an operator, but it's also a function of the x operator, right? So an example of this is if my uh, if I'm dealing with a harmonic oscillator, this will be I think taught uh, later on in this course. You'll see that the uh, form 
of the harmonic oscillator potential energy can be given as one half k x squared. Okay, and here it should be understood that this is not just a variable, but this is also a um, operator. And the Hamiltonian here, uh, very similarly to the classical mechanic counterpart, is going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy So it's going to be like that. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, we have, again, I would like to stress this, we have operators. Okay, operators that act on the wave function, on the wave function. Okay, and so if we want to do quantum mechanics mathematically, we have to understand what these operators are and what, what, how they act on, uh, on wave functions. So uh, I'll do a couple of examples. So let's say we have an operator that we define as A, and we say, well, this A, let's let it just be some uh, derivative. When we say that an operator acts on a function, it means that it transforms it into a function. So you, I give you a function, you have an operator that acts on that function, it gives you a second function. So let's say they have an operator A, which is a derivative, and let's say that you have some function f of x, which is just x to the power of 6. When I say A acts on f of x, what I'm saying is I'm saying that this operator acts on this function, and what I'm getting at the end is another function which is 6 times x to the power of 5. Okay, very simple. Uh, I can also have operators which are a little more complicated, so if I construct this third derivative plus this uh, x to the, to the 3, and I have here some function, some exponential function, which is e to the alpha x, Alpha just being some uh, some number, then b acting on this particular f will give me minus x three plus x three x. So it's basically a machine that converts one function into another function. Very simple. Now, we can sometimes, if we want, and this will happen very often, uh, have construct one operator from two other operators, okay? So if we have uh, an operator C, and I define this operator C to be an operator A plus an operator B, uh, and then I ask myself, well, what is the action of operator C acting on some function F? Well, this is very simple, it's just, the action of, it's just a plus b acting on fx, and this will just be the action of a acting on f plus b acting on f. Okay, so this is a addition of two, two operators. I can also define uh, operators as being some form of products. So if I have a operator D, which I define as A sort of multiplied by B, right, and I ask myself, well, what is D acting on F? The way I will do this is I will say, okay, well, let B first act on F. And then let A act on the outcome of this, right? Here order is very important. 
if I define D as the, like this, I need to do it order by order. So I need to act on B first, B acting on F first, and then A acting on the result of, uh, of B and F. Okay, and I'll show some examples where this order is uh, important. Uh, some operator, another operator that is uh, that you need to get familiar with is an operator called the identity operator. And uh, you guys just need to know that this thing exists. You guys will probably tell me, well, what is this used for? And I'll give you some examples. You guys might not understand why these, what, what these examples are, but just know that there is such an identity that exists. And, uh, and this operator, when it acts on F, it gives you back F. Okay? It doesn't do anything. It just gives you back the thing that you gave it. Uh, now, we can also define sort of powers of operators. Right, so if I say A to the power 3 acting on Fx, this means that I have A acting on A acting on A acting on X. Right? So what do I do here is I have A acting on F. I calculate what this is. Then I have A acting on what, what I got at the beginning. And then I act on this thing with A, uh, with A again. Right? So that's what it is. OK, so let's do uh, a few examples. So let's say I have uh, A plus B acting on fx, and I define a as being a derivative, and I define b as being just uh, x, right? And then I have f being this function here, okay? And I ask myself, well, given these definitions, what is uh, the action of a plus b on f? This will be the action of a acting on F plus the action of B acting on F. Uh, so if I find the derivative of this thing, it'll give me log of X plus uh, X divided by X. And X, now this is A. Now if I want to find B acting on F, then I have X times X log X, which is And that's it. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, if I have an operator A that I define as X and an operator B, which is uh, a derivative here, and I have a function of x that I define as x times e to the minus x. Here's an interesting question. Is it true that a acting on b acting on f equals the same as B acting on A acting on F. Okay? And so to figure that out, what we have to do is construct this thing, construct this thing, uh, do some math, and then compare at the end. Okay, so let's compare this side first. So I have this over here, I have this function here, okay, so this is this one, and what this is is, okay, so I'm going to do it step by step. So I find the derivative of this, so this gives me uh, e to the minus a plus uh, minus 1 
times e to the minus x times x okay so then I have uh, to the square minus x okay so this is the right side Now, if I do the left side, uh, I find the derivative of x acting on x e to the minus x. So it's b acting on a acting on f. OK, so this gives me x squared so then I do x uh, plus minus x times x square and then I'm going to do x to the cube By the way, I'm really bad at algebra, so I might have made a mistake somewhere. Maybe not. Uh, anyways, so here I have, so, I, so this is the right side. The left side was 2. Okay, so I have uh, one side. Here I have the other side. Okay, and now if I compare them, I see that no, they are not, uh, they're not the same. Okay, so the answer to this question, is it true that uh, A acting on B acting on F equals the same as B acting on A acting on F? The answer is no. Okay, now, when this holds, When it so happens that you have two operators and the order in which you apply them to a function gives you different results, so when this is, not, this is the case, when uh, this property holds, it is said that A and B do not commute. Okay, so there is a, a word to describe this. It's the word commute, okay? Which means that the order in which you exercise the operators on the functions matters, okay? You need to be very careful, okay? So if A and B commute, it would thus mean that uh, the order in which you apply them is not relevant. Okay, so if this is the case, then we say that A and B commute. Okay, now, just to be uh, very clear here, you might ask, you might say, well, Rami, this is nice, you got them to not commute, but what if I gave you another F in which they did commute, in which the operation on the left and the operation on the right, um, uh, these two gave me the same thing. I will still tell you that they do not commute, because to say that two operators commute means they have to commute for every single imaginable function, okay? So, uh, so property of commutation needs to apply uh, 
for all f of x. Okay, so even if you, I give you two, op, uh, two functions, uh, two operators, and I ask you, do they commute? And you decide, okay, well, let's, you decide to test it by guess, by, uh, yeah, guessing or picking whatever, some function, and you do the test, and yes, they commute, well, it doesn't tell you that they commute, they just tell you that they commute for that specific function. But for you to say that they commute for everything, well, um, then, then, uh, then you need to do more, more and more tests. But com commutation needs to apply for every single, every single fx. Okay. Okay, now, uh, now an important uh, concept in uh, quantum mechanics is the concept of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. Okay, now sometimes you'll be given a, or encountering some operator A, and you will be asked what are the eigenfunctions of A. Now what this means is I give you a function, I give an operator A, find me some function, let me just change the, 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 the letter that I'm going to use because I've been using F a lot. Uh, what is the function G of X such that I get some number here times G of X? Which means that what is a function that when A acts on G, it doesn't really do anything, it just stretches it or it kind of compresses it. Right? So for example, if, uh, if I had an operator A and G was something like this, the action of A on this G would be to either make it kind of smaller, it would scale it down, so this would be some A times G of X where a would be smaller than 1. Uh, or another type of eigenfunction would be one where it's like this. And in this case, b would be greater than, greater than 1. So the action of, uh, so an eigenfunction is one that when the operator acts on it, it just compresses it or the, the, uh, kind of scales it down a little bit, just magnifies it in a particular way. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, you will encounter these, uh, these a lot. Let's do more examples. Actually, I would say that, huh, if not most, a, 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 great, a great proportion of quantum mechanics involves solving these sorts of problems. You're basically spending the entire, if you're doing a career in class in quantum mechanics, you're spending a great deal of your life finding eigenfunctions to some interesting operators. Uh, so this is important. Okay, so uh, an example. So let's say we have this operator, which is the derivative. What are the eigenfunctions of this derivative? Well, uh, we'll okay, let's test to see if this is an eigenfunction of the, of the derivative operator. So we do the deriv derivative and we get e to the 2x. So we've obtained back our function, and here this is a, a number, a scalar number, which is a alpha, right? So yes, e to the 2x is an eigenfunction of d over dx. Okay. Now, if we look at the another operator, now keep in mind that this is an important operator because this is related to the momentum operator, right? The only difference is that the momentum operator we had a minus i to the Planck constant here, uh, but okay. And here, this is also an important operator because this is related to the kinetic energy operator. Okay, so now if you want to find the eigenfunctions of this, and I'll be nice and I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you sort of the answer, you just need to check it. Is this an eigenfunction of this? And I do the operation. Okay, so I know that d squared over dx squared uh, is just basically the 
derivative acting twice, right? This was uh, given before, right? Okay, so I need to calculate this thing, so I do like this, so I say, okay, what's the derivative of sine? If my memory holds, it's cosine alpha x. If I do it again, I get uh, minus alpha squared times sine alpha x. Okay, so I was able to retrieve back my function from the beginning, but I also got in the process a scalar value, which is my minus alpha squared. Uh, so this is my eigenfunction. Now, you may ask me, okay, this is nice, this is math, whatever, who cares? But uh, it turns out that if you want to describe the translational motion of molecules, uh, it doesn't matter how big or uh, what the molecules are, usually you, one way to describe the translational motion of molecules is to take their center of mass and to describe this center of mass as a particle in a box. And the particle in a box eigenfunctions, uh, or there's a Hamiltonian associated with a particle in a box, is basically just this you know, second derivative. And so if you want to describe particles moving inside a box, you would be using what I've shown you here. At least this is one of the ways. Uh, in fact, in one of my uh, graduate courses, uh, we had to derive, you know this equation PV equals NRT that you learn in first, uh, first year? Uh, now when, usually when they t t teach this to you, they tell you, well, you know, this is by experiment and people have done a lot of experiment, it turns out that PV equals NRT. But it also turns out you can derive this expression from first principle, and one of the ways you could do it, there's many different ways in which you could do it, but one of the ways in which you could do it is to use this sort of concept, right? And you can solve this differential equation, you would be able to get the different energies and the wave functions of, a, of this particle in the box, which again just describes transla translational motion, and uh, if you do a lot more uh, calculations and uh, a lot of work, you would uh, at some point get PV equals NRT. But, the, but essentially, one of the starting points could be to start from, uh, from this, um, from this uh, quantum mechanical formalism. So uh, keep that in mind uh, in life or in the future. Okay. Uh, okay. Where am I? What else do I want to talk about? Okay, so, uh, right. So, the goal of quantum mechanics is given a time dependent wave function, extract from this uh, time dependent wave function the observables, right? That's goal. Goal number one. Another goal of quantum mechanics, goal number two, is given a wave function at time zero, tell me what the wave function is going to be at some other time. Okay, so knowing the, predict the future, essentially. Right? And there's a way to do this. The way to do this is to solve this. Uh, uh, This equation that is called the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So uh, the idea is that if, if you have this equation and you have this initial condition, you can uh, extract this thing. Now from this, you can then determine uh, your observables, right, in time. Right, so this is goal number one, right? So, you, if, if you know how to extract information from a wave function and you know how to pre, you know, d, d, uh, model how wave function changes in time, you can determine how the, your observables will change in time. Right? So energy, momentum, position, uh, almost everything, if you know how to 
play with the, the, the mathematical formulas that allow you to do both of these things, you can predict uh, a lot of things about the, the wave function in time and the, the properties, right? So, uh, right. Now, uh, so this is a very important equation. This is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And I'll rewrite it big here because uh, it is important. Okay, so this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And as you can see in the, this equation, you have a very uh, important operator, which is the uh, total energy operator, which I've introduced at the beginning of the class. And uh, this is also called the Hamiltonian. Now the Hamiltonian, um, um, unlike the momentum operator, or the kinetic energy operator, or the momentum operator, or all the other operators, is arguably the most important operator in quantum mechanics because it describes the time evolution of the Hamiltonian, right? Kinetic, just if you just have kinetic energy, you won't be able to get the evolution of the wave function. If you have a Hamiltonian, you have a pretty good chance, right? Uh, so this is very important. Not to say that the other ones are not important, just this one has a special key in quantum mechanics because it is in the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics. So it's uh, important. Um, and because it is important, people are trying to study this Hamiltonian and extract from it the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. Okay? Uh, right. Now, uh, Now, quantum mechanics is made of different postulates, different ideas that you just need to sort of accept and just, you know, roll with them. One of the key concepts in quantum mechanics, one of the key postulates, is that to every observable exists, uh, exists, maybe I screw up the word exists, uh, a operator uh, whose uh, eigenvalues can be observed in experiments. Now, what does this postulate mean? It means that if you have a, uh, we'll pick a historical example, hydrogen. Uh, one of the beginning of quantum mechanics was when people discovered that you cannot find every possible energy in hydrogen. Ener the, uh, hydrogen only has specific ener energy values, okay? And the reason why, well, it was explained in this sort of postulate, well, is explaining this postulate is that you cannot observe, when you're dealing with a quantum mechanical uh, object, you cannot observe any possible energy or any possible momentum or any possible potential energies. You can, all, you can just find in experiments the ones which corresponds to an eigenvalue of some operator. All right? What does this mean? It means that if I give you uh, the Hamiltonian of hydrogen, what this postulate tells you is that the only energies that you can find are the eigenfunctions of hydrogen, right? If I give you the momentum operator, the only momentum uh, values that you can get from experiments correspond to the eigenvalues of momentum. If I give you a, a diatomic molecule and it's vibrating, and I ask you, what is the energy corresponding to just the vibration? There's going to be a Hamiltonian corresponding to this 
oscillation and the Hamilton and the eigenfunctions of this oscillating Hamiltonian uh, are go uh, the eigenvalues are only going uh, the only thing you're going to observe from experiment you will not uh, be able to observe uh, anything else okay so I'll just try to uh, explain this point further it means that if I give you an observable so uh, if I give you an observable okay what you will do is you will say okay I want to know what are the observable values uh, that I can get from an experiment so for example take uh, a UV spectra right what is a UV well, like when you get a UV spectra what are the peaks that you're getting in the spectra well the peaks are the energies that your electrons of the molecule can absorb so if it's a UV spectra of benzene the 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 the, the peak of course the maximum um, the maximum peak corresponds to the difference in energy between some ground and excited state and uh, of, 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 of what the electrons in benzene can absorb, right? So they can't absorb every energy, they can only absorb energy which corresponds to this difference in energy, which means that the energies are uh, quantized, okay? There's not an infinite amount of them, it, it's very specific. So the question now is, well, what are going to be these energies from just calculation? I don't want to just go to a lab and do, a, uh, and do a, um, an experiment all the time, I want to be able to calculate this from some sort of either uh, some mathematical treatment or from some calculation using a computer. I want to be able to compute these. So the first thing that you will do is you will say, okay, well, I'm dealing with the UV spectra. So the UV spectra is denotes energy, right? So let's say the observable in question is energy. Okay, what you will do is you will from the knowledge of the observable that I'm testing you to find, you will construct the uh, quantum mechanical uh, operator. All right. So in this case, it is going to be the Hamiltonian. Then what you will do is knowledge of this Hamiltonian, you will determine You will determine all of the functions here that I've denoted as phi i x that in which when I feed it into the Hamiltonian will give me back the function un unharmed just with this you know number here and it turns out that when you do this procedure there doesn't exist uh, that, that that essentially is going to be a, um, a discretization a quantization of these of these uh, of these EIs over here and that's how you would calculate them right so a long time ago, people have done this, right? So when they wanted to explain the, 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 the spectrum for hydrogen, there's a very complicated Hamiltonian that you can write down on a piece of paper for the energy of hydrogen. And then, uh, you know, Schrodinger and all these people, when they did the math, which is relatively complicated, they found out these EIs. And when they calculated the differences between consecutive EIs, they were able to compare it to experiment and see that they have very good matching, uh, matching results. Right, um, so so all of the observables that you can see in experiment again, I'm, I'm trying to drive this home, correspond to eigenvalues of an operator in quantum mechanics. Right. So what I'm trying to s try to show you guys is that there is sort of like a a mapping, a correspondence between real life and sort of theory. Right. You can from theory deduce what real life is going to do. Right. So from some operator, quantum mechanical operator, you can determine what the, uh, what the real life observations are going to be. Okay? So uh, here I gave the example of a Hamiltonian, but you can do this for any other. So if you have momentum, for example, you would have to find uh, eigenfunctions of momentum and these eigenfunctions would be the possible momentums that you can uh, that you can observe. Here, I'm going to use a a tilde here to say that these two might be different. The eigenfunctions of Hamiltonian and the eigenfunctions of the momentum might not be the same functions; they might differ. And even something like position 
has its own set of eigenfunctions. Okay? So these are the eigenvalues. Okay? So any operator in quantum mechanics, uh, you can use it by, by first finding out the, expect, like the, uh, the eigenvalues of this operator, and then whenever you do an experiment, you will see those, those eigenvalues in somehow represented in real life. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to understand your question. So you're talking about in, in the framework of you have a molecule and then you have a bunch of other molecules around it? Is that? Like life, like I'm trying to connect this to everyday life. Okay. Uh, I understand that like, we've broken it down to like the previous, yeah. one Yeah. Um, so, are you asking me if is there a limitation to using this quantum mechanical formulism to very large things? Uh, there are some people out there who are using, I mean, using you know the wave function of the universe inside of their theories. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know how they how they do that, but yeah. So, I mean, I think this is called quantum cosmology or something. There's areas of physics in where. You know, yeah, they, they treat the wave function of the universe. Now, they don't treat it, you know, specifically in detail. They have some type of scheme, which is, uh, I, I think of it as re relatively mesoscopic. Like, they're not considering every variable, but, they're, but, but essentially the, 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 the quantum mechanics allows them to treat the entire, the entire universe as if it was just a system described by some wave function. And then uh, if they want to determine the properties of this wave function, then they would use some operators and some very more fancy stuff than what I've shown here. So uh, is there a limitation to using quantum mechanics to bigger things? No, absolutely not. Quantum mechanics can apply to any, well, okay, what I've shown you here can apply to anything uh, as long as it's in a vacuum, right? So essentially, if you're dealing with a, a situation where you have uh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. The 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 way that you would, of course, like the, for example, the the Hamiltonian of a hydrogen atom is very diff is very different from. The Hamiltonian of a of a methane molecule, like uh, you wouldn't be able to extract anything out of a methane molecule that would have to do with hydrogen, even though the meth methane has hydrogen atoms inside, right? So, however, there, I mean, the, so in that in, in that scenario, you uh, the, the the methods that I'm showing you here only apply in vacuum. So, what you would have to do to study hydrogen is you have to you know have uh, maybe hydrogen molecules or hydrogen atoms in vacuum, not in, into contact with anything else. Uh, so that's, that's an experimental's job to make sure that it doesn't, it's not interacting with anything. So in a vacuum, it, it applies. Now, if you want to treat methane, well, there's nothing that really prevents you from treating methane as a system of its own. And so instead of studying hydrogen, you study, be studying methane. So you, and okay. So, um, so yeah, but there is another branch of quantum mechanics wh where you could use, you could treat not just the system in its entirety, but subsystems, right? So there is a branch of quantum mechanics that allows you to 
to, to say, okay, well, I, I have this particle, it's interacting with a, a bunch of other stuff. I don't care about this bunch of other stuff. I can just model this thing, and I can model this evolution in time, but I can make a certain set of reasonable approximations about how this specific subsystem interacts with the environment, and, uh, and I can model what the interactions are, and then I can you know, get some s sort of, um, get some sort of uh, knowledge about what this, what, this, what this object is doing. Now, what your, what your point is, and this is actually very true, is that when this object is inside of a, of a medium, of a media, yes, the information that you can extract from it is relatively incomplete. Yeah, there is some, a, a good loss of information. And actually, people are trying to uh, sort of determine, right, how can we uh, model this sort of incompleteness of information with respect to this object in a, in a, in a, in a thing. So there's an entire area related to this, which uh, unfortunately I'm not very, very familiar with. I just know that it exists. But even in that area, you can still use tools of quantum mechanics to extract information about your system in a, an environment. So. So yeah. yeah. Uh, where was I? Okay. Okay. Now, uh, right. So this is the sort of information you can extract or you can predict from uh, that an experiment is going to give you. Now, I'm going to try to link this between what I've said right now and to the note, like the, the sort of the concept of a wave function. Now, given a wave function, given a wave function, uh, let's remove time from, let's just say we have a wave function. It may or may not be dependent on time. Uh, it, it can, Oh, sorry. It may or may not be an eigenfunction of a property operator. All right, so. What does this mean? It means I give you a wave function, two possibilities, not, not three, not two, uh, not two, not three, not five, not seven. Uh, it is an eigenfunction of some operator, or it is not. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now this is always the case, okay? Now, what does this mean when the wave function is in an eigenstate of an operator? Okay, so let's say we have, uh, let's say we have the Hamiltonian that corresponds to uh, the vibrations of the molecular oxygen. Okay, let's say we have this, and here this is just the vibrations. So I'm gonna call it O2 uh, vibrations, okay? Now, let's say that I have some wave function. This is given to me, you're telling me, Rami, I prepared my molecules in the eigenfunction of vibrations of molecular, hydrogen, uh, molecular oxygen, and I say, great, Let's, uh, what, let's determine what the energy is. So, because it is an eigenfunction, what I know is I can, I know what this is, I know what this is, so this is going to be a function of x. x in this kind of uh, thought experiment is the, uh, it's the diatomic distance between uh, the two oxygen atoms, okay? And let's say you have the wave function, it's a, it's a, it's a function of the difference in, in uh, the two atoms. I say, great, let's find out what the energy of this molecule uh, in this eigenstate. So I operate it on it, and through some calculations, I get some number. Uh, I 
Okay? And so now, I know exactly what the energy of my, of the vibration of oxygen. Okay? So this scheme, I know exactly what it is. Okay? So, if you're lucky, if you can prepare a system in an eigenfunction of an operator, then you can directly extract the properties you want from it. So here you have energy, very simple. You figure out what the energy of this molecule is. You know, uh, essentially, the the total amount of kinetic plus potential energy that this thing is having. So if E is getting bigger, if you have uh, two, let's say two systems, two wave functions, one for uh, O2 and another one where O2 is prepared in another eigenfunction, and you compare both and they have different energies, it means I'll, you can think about it as one of them is vibrating more chaotically and more violently than the other, just by looking at the different eigenstates um, that, that they give you. Okay, now this is possibility number one. Uh, and if you have this, you should be pretty happy. However, most of the time, we're going to be dealing with this uh, situation where the wave function will not be an eigenstate of, uh, of, any op of um, the operator that you're interested in. However, there's another sort of key concept in... Uh, Quantum mechanics is that uh, any um, quote unquote acceptable wave function can always be written. as a linear combination of eigen of eigen functions of a property of a property operator. Okay, so this is a very important concept in quantum mechanics. Either it is an eigenfunction of some operator, or it's a linear combination of eigenfunctions of an operator, right? Which means that if I give you any psi, so this is your wave function, uh, it's a function of x, I can write it as a sum of some number, ci is going to be some number, times phi i. And these phi i's, so if I'm dealing with some operator here, these phi i's will be such that they satisfy this equation. So this is what I mean. Uh, when I say that an acceptable wave function, an acceptable wave function means that it's a wave function that I can sort of create in life, right? It's not just a theoretical, because sometimes you can make up a wave function in a computer or whatever, but it does, but we'll see this later, it won't satisfy certain conditions such that you can see it in life. But if it's a physically realizable wave function, it will be uh, such that it can be written as a linear combination of eigenfunctions of of a property uh, operator, right? So, what does this mean? It means that, let's say I have, again, my Hamiltonian that describes the vibration of my O2 molecule, okay? Let's say that I have the capacity to uh, create all of the eigenfunctions, all of the eigenfunctions, uh, I have the ability to derive all of the eigenfunctions of this uh, operator. Okay, so I'm very good at math, and I've been able to do this. Okay, and now I know every single one that can, that if I put it, if I have this, operate on this, will give me a number operating on it back. Okay, I can do this. 
means that if I have such situation and I have a, a wave function for some corresponding to the vibrations of this O2 molecule, I can write this as, uh, for example, uh, as a 0 0.1 times phi 1x plus 0 0.2 phi 2x plus 0 0.005 times phi 5x, so on and so forth, to even like something like 0 0.25 phi 100 x. Okay, so I can do this. I can write this wave function as a linear combination of all eigenfunctions of, uh, of uh, the hydrogen cor corresponding to the vibrations of my O2 molecule. Okay, so uh, right. Now, in the example that I just gave you, uh, these are called expansion coefficients, okay? And these can either be real, they can either be real numbers, they can be positive, they can be negative, but here's the catch, they can also be complex. So a week ago you guys learned about complex numbers and things like that. Here's where they enter into the sort of formalism is that these things can be uh, complex numbers. So if you want to deal with a wave function of a system that is not a linear combination of eigenfunctions, you have to learn, you have to deal with their expansion coefficients, so you have to deal with complex numbers. Okay, now this is uh, maybe a little complicated. I know it took me some time to kind of understand what this means. So before we deal with wave functions and stuff, let's deal with something which is perhaps uh, simpler uh, to deal with, which are vectors. All right? So let's sort of do quantum mechanics, but just dealing with vectors. Okay. So, uh, instead of assuming that we're dealing with wave functions, let's assume that we're dealing with vectors. Okay? And so, uh, assume you're dealing with, uh, so I'll call this section vectors. Now, uh, what does this mean? Let's assume that you have a vector, and uh, let this vector, which I'm going to call uh, v, let this be uh, five, six, six, five. So this means that this is six. This is five. Now, believe me when I say that pretend that these vectors are eigenstates of a property operator. Pretend that the, uh, the, ax the uh, access, uh, axes x and y are eigenvectors of some O. Okay, and this one as well, this is an eigenvector of some operator. Now, any vector here that I can draw can either be along x, so it's an eigenvector of the operator, because it equals to, it, it corresponds to x times some scalar number, or it can be along y, okay, so it's another, another eigenvector of the operator, or it can be written as a linear combination of x and y, right? So here v equals to 6 times the vector x plus 5 times the vector y, right? So again, this, this is an analogy. Pretend that this is my wave function, and these are eigenfunctions of my observable. Any wave, any wave function that I can plot here, any eigenvector that I can draw, will systematically be a linear combination of these two. Okay? Now, uh, because you guys, I don't know if you guys have done uh, linear algebra in a while, or uh, if you guys know linear algebra, I don't know. But uh, I'll take this opportunity to go over some 
concepts in, in linear algebra. So uh, these things are called elements of a basis. So these are, are vectors which form a basis. Okay, so x and y, they form a basis, which means that you can use them to represent in this form any other vector uh, that you want to draw. Okay? Uh, right. Now, one thing that you can do with, uh, with vectors, you can do it with functions too, but here we're going to look at it with vectors, is you can define, or you can construct the length of a vector. And the way that you do it is you, uh, you take something called a dot product. So this is uh, so what you do is you write the the vector in this form, right? So a vector in a, in a row form, the vector in a column form, and what you do is you do this uh, dot product thing, and then what you're going to get is 36 plus 25, and the length of the vector which I'm going to call L, is going to be the square root of this. So 36 plus 25, and I think uh, it's roughly 7.81. Right? So with vectors, you can define their length. So this is, very, this is basically Pythagoras' theorem. Right? 6 squared plus 5 squared. Square root of that, you get the length of the vector. Okay, now, this is a, a nice way to think about wave functions. I do it all the time. If I'm ever stuck thinking about linear combinations of, of eigenfunctions, I usually say, okay, well, if I just think about vectors and whatever, uh, what would that give me? Uh, right, now, remember that these are analogous, this six and this five, are analogous to the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 that I, that I talked about before. And I said that these uh, numbers could potentially be complex. In a way, vectors that I can draw here could also be complex. Because I can come up with a vector that I'm going to call w, and this is going to be 7i, 8. And this will be nothing but 7i times the, the vector x plus 8 times the vector y. Okay? And so this can be done. Now, just like I can define a length of this vector, the question is, can I define a length for this vector where the elements of the vector are complex or imaginary or whatever? Okay? And the idea is, yes, I can. However, to do it, I need to be strategic. Why? Because let me show you what will happen if I do it the, uh, the I don't know, for lack of a better word, uneducated way, right? Where, so the uneducated way would be, okay, so I have 7i, 8, 7i, 8. This is a, a row vector. This is a column vector. I'm going to multiply both of them, and then I'm going to take the square root. Okay? So I'm going to have 49 minus plus, uh, okay, just for sort of, my, my example is going to work against me, so let's just put one here. Okay, pretend like I started with uh, 1 instead of 8. Okay, so then I'm going to have uh, minus uh, 49. And then I'm going to have 1 times 1, which is 1. And then I'm going to take the square root. So this is going to be the square root of 48. And now, through this scheme, I've got a negative length. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Complex numbers are weird. They're tricky to deal with. But trust me when I say they never give you a negative length. Any vector, whether it's complex, um, imaginary, whatever, will give you a positive length. Length is a physical object. You can see it. So some things, we, we screwed up here. Now, the reason I screwed up is because when you're defining the length of vectors and you have uh, imaginary components here, 
technically the recipe is not to take just to do this. It's actually, so this is uh, wrong. Technically the recipe should be to do minus 7i 1 times 7i 1. And I take the square root of this. Okay? So whenever you're taking the, the dot product between two vectors, you need, what you need to do is to, when you, when you, when you write down the row, the, the row vector, whenever you see a minus, sorry, whenever you see an i, you need to put a minus in front of it. Okay? And so if you carry out the operation in the following matter, what you'll have is you'll have 49 times i to the minus i times uh, plus 1. Okay, i times i equals minus 1, minus 1 times minus 1 equals 1. So at the end you end up with 49 plus 1. So the answer is the square root of 50. Okay, so this is how you find the dot product when the, the, the components of the vectors are complex. Okay? Very simple. What you do is whenever you see a minus 1, you just put, whenever you see an i, you put a minus 1 there. Okay? Now another example is let's say you have a, a vector m. And let's say the components of vector m were 1 minus i, um, 2 plus i. And I ask you, what is the length of m? So the length of m, I will denote it as m with two lines on the side. This is the length of m. I know it's positive, so how do I do that? Well, let's follow the procedure that I said here. So you're going to have one here, but where you see i, you're going to put a minus, uh, you're going to invert the sign. So here the sign was minus i, you're going to do this. And then here you're going to have 2 minus i. I'll just put a comma here to denote the x and y components. And here you're just going to rewrite your vector as it was given. Here you're going to have i, 1 plus i, times 1 minus i, plus 2 minus i, times 2 plus i. Now when you're coming to this part, what you're going to do is you're going to pretend like it's just a couple of numbers. So you uh, use, I think it's called the chain rule. It's the one where you do 1 times 1 equals 1, 1 times minus i equals minus i, uh, minus i plus 1 times plus 1 equals plus i, i times minus i equals plus 1, 2 times 2 that's 4, 2 times i that's plus 2i, minus 2i times 2 that's minus 2i, minus i times plus i equals plus 1. Okay, so the i's here, they go away, they cancel each other. Now what you're stuck is, is 1 plus 1, which is 2, and then you have 4 plus 1, which is 5. So the length of this vector is the square root of 7. Uh, in quantum mechanics, it's going to represent the probability of finding a particle in a given uh, in a given space, given area of space. There's many different applications. The one that I can think that you guys could understand is is that it's probably you would use this to find the probability distribution uh, of a given wave function, right? So the idea here is that your wave function would be represented by a vector 
And if you want to find the possibility of finding this, this, this uh, a particle and some wave function, then you would, uh, you would take the wave function times, uh, okay, yeah, I need, I need to insert, so, okay, so this thing, this vector here, is called the complex conjugate. Okay, so this is the vector, this is the complex conjugate of the vector, right? So the probability, so if, if, if this denoted a, a wave function, then the uh, square of the product of the wave function times its uh, complex conjugate would give you the probability of finding an electron in some area of space. So that's what it would mean. Okay. Now, another cool thing that you can do with, uh, with vectors is that you can, uh, Uh, okay. Another, okay. So here we talked about vectors, and I and I tried to tell you that okay, vectors can correspond to wave functions. That wave functions can correspond to vectors. Whatever sort of, whenever you're you're dealing with a wave function, you don't you, really, you don't really need you don't really know how to kind of manipulate it. Then think of it as a vector, and chances are you can you can it, it'll work. It'll, in the analogy of a, of a vector space, the wave function will make sense. Uh, so before we talked about operators. I said that operators act on functions, and uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with them. But uh, if the wave function, if wave functions can be thought of as vectors, what is an operator to a vector, right? And so, an operator. So, for example, I said that an operator acts on a function x, and it'll give you some other function g of x. Now, let's say that instead of f of x, you had a, a vector. Let's say the vector was uh, 1, 1. Okay, an operator would be a matrix. And it would be a matrix, it would be a 2 by 2 matrix in this particular case. So for example, it would be something like this. Right, so it would be a 2 by 2 matrix. And uh, you would have some numbers here. Okay, here I'm just putting some random stuff. And uh, the action of this operator on this vector uh, would be like this. So it would be A, B, B, D acting on this vector. All right, so the way you operate, you have matrices acting on vectors is you do A, uh, A, B times uh, this thing. So it would be the dot product here. So it would be A uh, plus B. So that's one element. Then you have B plus D. Okay, so for example, if this, if, if O equaled 7, 1, uh, 1, 8, then, then O acting on F, this vector would have been 7 plus, plus 1, 1 plus 8, Okay, so uh, operators in, in vector calculus are given as matrices. Okay, so whenever you see an operator, either it's acting on a, on a functional space or it's acting on a vector space. If it's acting on a functional space, it's a function of x. It'll have derivatives, uh, it'll have other functions involved. If it's a vector space, then it's, it will just be a matrix. And it'll have the same dimensionality, it'd be squared most of the time, and uh, or all the time, and then it would it, 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 and then it would um, it would act on the elements of this uh, vector. Now, there is a very important vec uh, operator that you guys need to be aware of, and this operator is called a rotation operator. So here's what it does. So let's say I have um, let's say I have a, a vector here. Let me call this vector V. Let's say that I want to rotate this vector by some angle, theta. All right, so I have some V of X, V of Y, and I want to come, and I want to come up with uh, OK, 
Okay, so these are the elements of my matrix. And I want to come up with some operator that will transform, will rotate this vector to, let's say, W. Okay, so let's say that the So what is the vector that uh, would allow me to get to get this w? Uh, you guys can play with it for, it's actually fun to play with, but after you've, you've played with it for a long time, you would find out that the operator that performs this uh, sort of uh, rotation, it rotates a vector from one direction to the other, to another, would uh, take in the form of cosine of theta minus sine of theta, sine of theta, and cosine of theta, right? So if you ever want to rotate vectors in space, you know what the angle you want to you wanna rotate them with, just plug this angle into the different elements here, apply the resulting operator on the, ve the input uh, vector, and then the result would be the output vector. So this is how you would... Uh, you would do it. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's a good question, and uh, I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Um, okay, so I, I said at the beginning that you can write down the wave function as a linear combination of eigenstates of property operators, okay? So let's say that I have a wave function. It's a function of x, and I can write it as c1... Uh, Omega uh, phi one x plus c two phi two x. Okay, okay. So I have a function, and I know I can write it down as the sum of two other functions, right? And c one and c two are some some numbers. Okay. Now let's say that I don't like dealing with phi one and phi two. I don't like it. I don't know why. I don't like it. I want to rewrite this as alpha one. Um, Epsilon x plus alpha 2 epsilon 2. Right? So, uh, in a sense, this, the, the difference between them is that is just these, I just rewrote this function. This, okay, so this function was a linear combination of phi i, and this one is a linear combination of other functions. Right? So the question now is, if I know what this is, if I know what these guys are, and I know what these guys are, I know what these guys are, I know what these guys are, I know what these guys are. The only unknown are the alphas, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Using this procedure, I can determine what phi i is, what phi 1 and 2 are. So the way it's going to be done is that I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Alpha 1 and 2, yeah. What did I say? Oh, sorry, sorry. Alpha 1 and 2. So I know C1, I know C2. I want to know if alpha 1 and alpha 2. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, okay, so I have some vector C1 and C2. And here I'm going to have cosine alpha sine alpha minus sine alpha and uh, cosine alpha. And I'm going to get at the end phi 1 and phi 2, right? So there is a scheme that you can use to go from one linear combination to another linear combination. Now the question now is, what is, what is theta, right? So, uh, so the way that you would calculate theta is you would calculate, uh, uh, this, this gets a little complicated, but essentially you would calculate the overlap between phi 1x and I believe you would use uh, 
So this would be, this would correspond to this cosine. Here you would use 2 Okay, so these are, I'm not going to go into the details of why this is the case, just trust me when I say this, but these are the, they, they just so happen to be the elements of this rotation matrix, right? So you know what phi i, you know what phi i is, what phi 1 is, what uh, epsilon 1 is, you're able to get this integral. You get a number. You do it again, you'd get a bunch of numbers here, you know what this is, you know what this is, you would, uh, do the matrix multiplication, and this would give you alpha one and alpha two, right? This is a this is a another way to write a uh, rotation matrix. So this is when you have okay, yeah. Okay, so maybe I'm repeating myself here, but th this is an important concept. Is sometimes you have your wave function written in a linear combination, and you don't want to deal with the functions in which it's written as a linear combination of. You want to write it as a different linear combination, right? right? So you would do this transformation, right? So the idea is that any wave function can be written as in different linear representations depending on what the property is, right? So phi i's here could be eigenstates of h. And the epsilons here could be written as uh, eigenstates of, uh, of kinetic energy. Right? So I can write this as a linear combination of eigenfunctions of H, or I can write this as a linear combination of eigenfunctions of T. Both of them give me the same wave functions, but the way that it's, uh, the way that it's manifested is different because you're using different things, different, way, uh, different uh, basis. So one way to go from one basis to another is to use this uh, rotation operator, that's right. Yeah. Um, but you slide the likelihood, you rotate the likelihood about these two eigenfunctions, which I kind of understand are like the parameters of this matter. Mm -hmm. And it's going to operate in this space that we created for hydrogen. Now it's flipped and access. Like, what was that? Yeah, so it's, it's, it, you brought up a good point, and this was actually going to be the next thing I was going to talk about. It turns out that when you rotate um, this, like you said, the state, of the system that you're describing, it doesn't affect its probability. Its probability is the same, regardless of yeah, regardless of how you represent it. It's the same, right? So the the mathematics doesn't change the probability and the, so the physics. Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, right, so this was going to be the... So the next point. Right, so I, actually I'll, I'll try to uh, kind of expand on sort of this point. Um, so when you write a vector like this, 1, 1, so this is your vector of interest, and this is x, this is another vector, this is y, it's another vector. When you're saying vector is 1, 1, what you're saying really is that the, this is going to correspond to 1 plus 1 y. Okay, so this is v. However, this is only one representation. Why? Because I could have written v as being 1 um, x pseudo x, which is another x plus zero y, pseudo y, where I define pseudo x as being one one, the vector one one, and I define pseudo y as being one minus one.
Okay? So I can write V in different ways, like this or like this. Uh, both ways you guys understand what I'm saying because I've, I've shown you exactly what I'm doing. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to use different basis I'm going to use different uh, vectors of reference. In the first case, I'm using x and y. In the second case, I'm using x tilde and y tilde. Now, when I'm writing the vector, when I'm vector, uh, Now, I'm write, when I'm writing a vector, the only thing that I really need to define are the expansion coefficients in front of the basis, the basic, the, the basis functions, right? So if I'm writing v like this, the reason why, I mean, this is, we, we, and, and since, I don't know, grade six, we've become accustomed that, you know, writing a vector like this is, you know, one here and one there, and so it's like that, right? But the idea is that if I were to change the basis, if I were to rotate the entire plane on which I'm drawing, my vectors, right, where now I want to deal with a vector here and a vector here, right, then I, now I want to denote this vector v, I would have to use different numbers, right? And so the numbers that I would use is 1, 0. This looks weird, but just because you guys have been, you know, conditioned to just thinking about this, right? But technically, these two vectors are the same vector, it's just they're written using different uh, basis vectors, okay? But that's, that's an important idea in quantum mechanics is that you can, have the, the, you can have the same vector, you can have the same function, you can use different numbers to describe it, but at the end of the day, it's the same vector. It's the same function, it's just, it's just you've used different uh, superposi super, uh, states at which you're creating superposition. So uh, just to throw it out there, I don't know if this is going to be uh, uh, kind of explaining class later. It's actually a little complicated, but usually when, when, when people in quantum mechanics, they want to talk about a vector or an eigen or a wave function, and they don't want to make any sort of, um, any, they don't want to say in which representation they're working on. They don't want to say, oh, I'm working in x tilde. Or, what they're going to say is they're just going to say it's, some, it's a vector v, and they're going to write it like this. In quantum mechanics, when you see this, it means that they're talking about a, a wave function or a vector but they're not specifying to you whether it's specifically in, in, in written in x tilde or just in x, okay? It's some vector, <laughs> think about it. And what the numbers are, what the specific numbers you're going to use are going to come later once you decide what basis you're gonna choose to write this in, okay? So this is sort of, my point is that these two vectors Right? If I were to show this to a physicist, he'd get confused. He'd say, well, what are you doing? If I tell him this is the, the, these two are the same vectors, they'd be like, no, they're not. But he gets confused because he's assuming that in both cases I'm dealing with this basis. But now if I write this, he says, ah, okay, good. I understand what you're saying. You're giving me the soul of the vector, and you're waiting to some time in the future where we're really going to be dealing with what basis we're going to be dealing with. Okay? So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, uh, but an important point is that the properties of this vector uh, do not depend on the representation. So I could be using x, y, or x, y, uh, y, y, y tilde, or x tilde, it doesn't matter, the properties are going to be the same. Um, so an example of what I'm trying to say, so, uh, uh, let me, I had an example here. Uh, example, example. Just to clarify, yeah. what's in the box? Is that like a line, a V, and then a, a greater than? This is the symbol. This is a line, and this is called a ket. This is just a triangle. That's the soul of the vector. That's called this, yeah, I call, I call it the soul of the vector. Uh, don't tell physicists that I told you this. Uh, it sucks for me because we're going to be on camera. But, uh, but, uh, but anyways, this is uh, one way to think about it. This means that we're not, tech, we're not talking about what the vector looks like technically, numerically. We're just talking about what it represents <laughs> idealistically, essentially. Um, right, I had an example here. I'm trying to find it. Ah, okay. So let's say that... Uh, 
let's say, uh, okay, let's say that I have, all right, I have these two vectors. I have a, a vector x and I have vector y. From vector x and vector y, I went to vector x tilde and y tilde. How did I do that? Well, the way that I did it is that I rotated these two vectors to you know, 45 degrees. So what I did here is I actually did cosine 45, sine 45 degrees, minus sine 45, And uh, I took vector x, which was 1, 0. And I got x tilde. And then I did the, the same thing. And I got uh, y tilde. OK? Now, uh, right. Now, when you do the math, it'll turn out that x tilde, uh, I believe, is 1 over the square root of 2. And y tilde is going to be 1 over the square root of 2 minus 1 over the square root of 2. Right? So, the, okay, you're going you're to tell me, well, this is not exactly what you wrote before. Uh, it, it, it is not. It's because uh, here I did not keep the norm. So when I rotated it, technically what I've done here is I, I not only rotated it, but I also stretched the, the vectors. But technically, if you, if I, had I done the rotation correctly, I would have gotten these two vectors, right? Uh, this, is just to, this is just to give a, kind of an example. Uh, Okay. Now, when you rotate the basis, so when you rotate a vector, what I want to show is that it doesn't change the properties of the vector. Okay? So, for example, this vector, vector x and vector y, if I calculate the dot product, I will notice that the dot product is uh, 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1 equals 0. Okay? So dot product tells us the sort of like, uh, uh, what, uh, if the dot product is 1, it means that the two vectors overlap on top of each other very well. Uh, and if they don't overlap at all, so if the dot product is 0, it means that they're completely perpendicular to one another. So in this case, what this dot product shows me is that x and y are perpendicular. OK, now, if I do the rotation of x, or rotated x times rotated y, OK, if the properties of x and y are the same before and after the rotation, I should get the same thing. I should see that even in this representation, they're completely perpendicular. So let's test this. So this is a uh, square root of 2, square root of 2, so this is going to be 1 divided by 2, 1 times 1, plus uh, minus 1 divided by 2 equals 0. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the basis is, the vectors will intrinsically be, um, have the same property. Does your basis have to be orthogonal? Yes. Yeah, that's another an important point. So, Key points, the vectors making up 
a basis need to be orthogonal. Another word for this, which I forget, is uh, linearly independent. That's a key point. Okay? Now, linearly independent means that I can now write one vector uh, as, uh, I, I can now write vector one as being uh, equal to some number times vector two, right? So if I have vector one, if, if, it, if it is linearly independent to vector two, it means that I cannot write vector one as this, okay? Or if I have some, you know, if I have three vectors, I cannot write them as Okay, so this forms a basis and uh, if I can show that vector 2 cannot be written as uh, w1 plus w3 If this is the case for some chosen vectors, w1, w2, w3, then these two or these three vectors will form a, a basis, okay? Meaning that I can come up with any other vector and I can write that other vector as a linear combination of these three vectors. Depends on the dimensionality of your problem. Total energy infinite. Yeah, infinite bases. Yeah, uh, infinite bases. Infinite bases. Except if you're dealing with spin. If you're dealing with spin, because there's only spin up and spin down, then you're you're stuck with two, two vectors. Yes, that's correct. Or to prove whatever it is that you want to prove. So if you've got some guy who, you know, introduces the Hamiltonian or some crazy MSI in Japan or something, you know, and you want to see if it's feasible to put that in a drug in a state, you know, bind it to some compound that you do, like, do you have to do, like, some gypsy witchcraft on his math to make it adaptable to those, or is it, like, formal? Is it, like, easily to do it in the fall? Uh... I don't know. Well, the, the problem is that you're describing two different Hamiltonians. So in, in, in the first case, he has the Hamiltonian of the enzyme. If you want to find the Hamiltonian of the substrate inside of the enzyme, you've changed the system. So now you have a Hamiltonian of the whole thing plus an enzyme. So it's, it's, you can't use... So the, the eigenfunctions of his, of his system won't be able to use for the eigenfunctions of your system because they have a sub... Yours has a substrate, right? So, okay, that's another point. If... if um, if, uh, I can use the different eigenfunctions, but it, I need to make sure that the dimensionality is the same. So, for example, um, if, if I have an eigenfunction of a system with uh, two dimensions, right, uh, I, I can't use it for the eigenfunctions or the wave function of a system with five dimensions, right? Because right? where are the other three dimensions going to come from? So, uh, it, 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 so, yeah, you need to make sure that the, 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 wave, the dimensionality of the problem is consistent, essentially. Uh, yeah, so you wouldn't be able to write a two-dimensional vector as a linear combination of three-dimensional vectors, right? Because you have, you, you know, they need to, you need to have, make sure the dimensionality is the same. Okay, so any further questions? Anything else? Okay, so uh, see you guys later. See you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye.